Hello, my name is uh, Mario Negro. I'm a partner at Steichman Elliott in Toronto. And today we'd like to talk about the future of healthcare after COVID. We're excited to have Dr. Sandy Buckman from the Canadian Medical Association join us today. Dr. Buckman is the president of the Canadian Medical Association. And more importantly, he's a doctor who's been on the front lines in healthcare in Canada for the last over 30 years. Dr. Buckman, thank you for joining us. We we want to talk to you about some of the changes that you've seen, both as a practitioner and as part of the, the profession with respect to uh, the impact of COVID on healthcare. The one that we notice, or all of us notice more than anything is the growth of telehealth and, and the technology that's used to provide what I would call frontline healthcare services. Historically, there's been a hesitancy to use uh, that technology. And in the last three or four months, it's just exploded uh, to the point where it looks like it's never going back to the old days. Uh, and we, we wanted to get a sense from you in terms of the both the thoughts about the permanency of telehealth and, and what it'll mean for driving frontline services. And then what you think of as the future of technology itself in healthcare, given the impact of COVID on service delivery? Well, uh, first of all, Mario, thank you for having me here and uh, and working, uh, being able to uh, present today. Um, the questions that you bring up are um, right on um, and they're happening right now. And I'll begin by uh, saying telehealth, telemedicine, I'm, we're referring to it as virtual care. Um, the genie is out of the bottle. Um, there's no going back on that. We've crossed a threshold. Um, and as you mentioned, it's literally exploded. You know, we recognize though, given the, ex the explosion of this uh, right across the country, um, through uh, as a result of COVID-19, we realize that it's not the technology. Um, the technology has always been there, but what we haven't had is we haven't had the policy, we haven't had the regulation, we haven't had the um, governance issues, we haven't looked at the safety, um, we haven't looked at remuneration issues or education and training. Um, one of the things that the uh, the Canadian Medical Association did, along with the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, our two main um, educational bodies and certification bodies for physicians in Canada. Um, we had a task force that went all through almost to 2019, and we actually released a report uh, in on February 11th, 2020, so just before the pandemic hit, hit Canada. And um, and it called for all these, uh, the examination of, of policy and regulation around it. Um, we're discovering that patients want it badly. Um, physicians have adapted to it in a major way. Governments are now uh, funding it, um, at least on a temporary basis. Uh, some of the provinces haven't, uh, said their fee codes will be will go beyond COVID. So uh, we're working on that. Um, you know, patients, first of all, uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, get their care online. You know, we're used to doing our banking online. We're used to now doing our shopping online. Why not get your medical care online? We know from many studies around the world, um, there's some excellent uh, data from the U.S., from some of the major um, health maintenance organizations uh, that show that more than 50% of their primary care actually takes place through virtual care. And by virtual care, let's define it for a moment, that could be telephone, it could be video conferencing, it could be uh, texting, uh, emails. In other words, it encompasses uh, all of that. Um, there are issues that many patients have with uh, privacy and data. Is it safe? Is it secure? Is my information going to be protected? Um, and those are the kind of conversations I think that we still uh, we still have to have across the country. And that's part of it's really what our task force uh, was going into. So I think the next step now is looking at those regulatory issues um, and, uh, and, and going from there. But it is here to stay.
Dr. Buckman, do you believe that there will be a uh, greater focus on technology in healthcare delivery, given what we've seen during the COVID crisis? Well, technology is growing all the time now. And um, because we can do so many things remotely, uh, yes, I do think it will increase. But virtual care and technology have its limitations, and there are some other principled issues. So, for example, uh, virtual care has the as a big opportunity now to improve access to healthcare, especially for remote and rural Canadians. Um, it can even make access a lot easier for those with mobility challenges and, um, and, and who are maybe older or frail uh, and elderly, um, but not enough people have access to the technology. Um, so for remote and rural, yes, it improves, but a lot of Canada doesn't have broadband high-speed internet yet. And the ability to do these kind of uh, conference calls, aside from telephone calls, is very, is very challenging and difficult. We are going to see necessary investment by the federal government in getting uh, broadband high-speed internet, for example, right across the country, because there's so many areas that still don't have it. Um, we need to look at some of the equity issues. So that frail elderly person uh, at home um, may not have access to this technology. Um, I work on providing palliative care on the streets of Toronto in the shelters and uh, in some of the church basements and literally on the street. And a lot of my patients um, don't have access to technology. Um, and they are even ones in during this COVID area that are also particularly impacted. So we've got to really rethink about those uh, equity issues of access. Um, but given those limitations, and as we work through this, yes, this is the way of the future and, uh, and people are adapting to it well. Um, and um, yeah, again, no going back, but uh, we're on a roll here. Well, one of the other changes that uh, we we hear a lot about uh, since the beginning of the COVID crisis, and we expect will lead to more fundamental changes, uh, relates to the care of seniors and and uh, you know there's been some fundamental issues that have been brought up. Uh, during COVID, given the impact of uh, the disease on seniors, and, and more importantly, the the care that's provided to seniors in in all its different forms and capacities, and I wanted to get your thoughts again from both a frontline perspective and from a CMA perspective on uh, the changes that you think uh, are coming uh, to the quality and, and delivery of services to seniors, whether it's in a, in a home uh, or, or generally speaking, given the experience um, of the disease and its impact on seniors? Wow. Um, I'm only pausing because it's a, it's a challenging question. There's so many aspects to it. Um, I think what's happened with the pandemic is that, is that the pandemic has exposed the weaknesses and, and gaps in our healthcare system. Um, if we look back to the 60s when our uh, quote unquote universal healthcare system came into being, it was really focused on caring for a younger population. I think in the mid 60s, the average age of the population was 27. And now we're uh, uh, somewhere up in the 50s um, in terms of our average age, indicating that we have a large and growing number of seniors. The fastest growing segment of the population is actually people over 100. So um, uh, we designed a system that uh, was for acute care. It was hospital based and it covered physicians fees and that was it. Um, and then as we aged, uh, got better at looking after people, at looking after ourselves, um, a whole cohort of the population, the boomer generation, of, again, which I'm a part, um, we grew and um, we're living now with, uh, with multiple uh, medical conditions. We call them multiple comorbidities. And we live with these diseases and we live with them for years. And uh, as we age, we become more frail. Um, and 
we had to develop a sort of a parallel system in long-term care. Uh, kind of, we've ended up where people couldn't look after themselves at home, couldn't afford the care to to be looked after at home, and had to enter into these uh, long-term care facilities. And they become the poor cousins of the healthcare system. And sadly, uh, the tragedy that occurred in Canada, where 80% of the deaths of related to COVID have occurred in seniors who lived in long-term care for all the reasons we we know of. Uh, you know, uh, personal support worker staff who had to cobble together a full-time job by working in different institutions and then and then uh, transmitting the virus into long-term care. Uh, infrastructure in within some of these facilities that have like four different people to a room. Um, there are many, many issues that really need to be examined uh, in the long-term care facilities in the whole system. Um, are some of the solutions even to open the Canada Health Act to uh, to re-examine that and, and include a seniors uh, and long-term care as part of the overall system so that it is adequately funded? Uh, many groups are looking at that. Another solution potentially that we're considering is that most seniors want to age in place. They want to be home. Uh, maybe we don't have to spend the money on building new facilities. Uh, we could actually put that money into providing greater and greater home care. And this is again where virtual care comes in. Uh, again, I'll just go back to my example because it's relevant. Uh, again, as a palliative care doctor, I look after people in their homes. And it'd be wonderful for not only to make the visit and care for them there, which I do right now anyway, but that's only in certain areas of the country, but to work with a nurse or a family member and and uh, using uh, an iPad or, or even a phone, a laptop, I could actually do a significant assessment virtually that improves access for these patients. I can avoid, you know, bad weather conditions and and high traffic. And we should now begin to use the technology to improve access, put the money into that, put the money into to care in the home, more personal support, worker support, uh, medical backup for these people so that we don't necessarily need to get into long-term care. COVID actually showed us that for seniors living at home, we're at 100 times less risk than those seniors living in long-term care uh, in terms of their risk of dying from the disease. So um, we have to rethink everything about, uh, about our aging population, about aging in place, uh, the overall care of seniors, and in particular, uh, really reforming our long-term care facilities. Dr. Buckman, I wanted to get uh, your thoughts on uh, the preparedness that we as a country, uh, the steps we've taken to be prepared for uh, concerns about a second wave of COVID or a, a resurgence or feeling that it's not over and that there may be uh, another another increase in cases for, for whatever reason, but particularly as we as we continue to open up and try to get back to normal. Do you think that we're ready for uh, another surge or another wave of cases and um do you, do you you know what steps do you think we should be taking or have taken to, to get ready well i have no crystal ball but um and at this moment in time and based on the evidence that i'm hearing from infectious disease specialists uh, public health specialists epidemiologists um I'd have to say that, that a second wave is probable, but not inevitable. Uh, two or three months ago, I would have said a second wave was a certainty, but I'm, I'm hedging a little bit because I, I think it, it depends. In other words, there's a big if here. It's first of all, asking myself the question, can we avoid a second wave as a society? Are we prepared for it or can we avoid it? You know, when the first wave hit, we had to revamp everything. We, we, we kicked out patients out of hospital. We, uh, we postponed all surgery, postponed all elective care. And remember, elective isn't that it was cosmetic. Elective just referred to um, 
serious surgeries like cancer surgery or heart disease surgery that could just that weren't urgent or emergent we just were able to schedule them later and and uh and now we were able to flatten the curve through the public health measures we took at staying at home uh isolation um good hand hygiene and now uh, wearing of masks uh, because that information came through. And I think with the learning that we've developed, we have the potential to avoid a massive second wave and not overwhelm our healthcare system. But it's an if. It's if we um, implement widespread contact testing, if we implement uh, immediate um, tracing through the use of technological apps, as well as armies of manual contact tracers. And if they, then, once we've identified those people that are ill, we, um, we institute isolation procedures. So we're sort of saying test, trace, and isolate. Um, so we have to respond rapidly. Um, we have to adhere to the physical distancing measures uh, on a long-term basis. I think as a society, uh, we have to get used to living with COVID. Uh, we live now, as, as I mentioned earlier, with our aging population, we, we personally live with many diseases and we live longer. And, our, our, and Canadians have to get used to living with the disease in our presence. If we live with restrictions uh, on a long-term basis, if we continue to practice those public health measures that I mentioned, including mask wearing in indoor spaces, I think we have the opportunity to, to be prepared for a second wave. Um, in other words, the wave won't be a massive surge, but we might start seeing a series of small waves like humps. Um, and rather than having to to close down again, close down our economy and our businesses, what we'll be able to do is, is kind of get through them and find that balance, find our way through these curves, kind of like moguls on a ski hill, and, and uh, not overwhelm our healthcare system and be able to be able to manage. If, however, we don't demonstrate that uh, accountability society, particularly the physical distancing uh, and wearing a mask of indoor spaces, if we become complacent because we felt so restricted, I think we will find that we will get a second wave and a bigger wave, uh, and we will not be uh, prepared. So we're betting on continuing getting these messages out and, uh, and then allowing our society, our businesses to cope. We need to reopen the, the, the uh, living with poverty, unemployment, uh, increase in sense of intimate partner violence, the effect on on children uh, and adolescents in not having school, um, the delays in seeking uh, treatment for their ongoing medical conditions from diabetes to cancer are very, very concerning. So I think our choice is, is going to be to live with this disease in, in a far more restricted way and hopefully not have to deal with the surge.